Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Clearing the Fog. Lifting the fog of miscommunication, misunderstandings, and misrepresentation of Islam and the teachings that go along with it. This is your host, Yusuf Estes, and I would like to continue in this particular segment of our series talking about the treatment of women. And this is just one example of how people misunderstand something and the proper way to give the answer to help the people to better understand and even come to Islam themselves. I happened to have been in Florida during Ramadan one time, and after the talk that we gave in the masjid, there were two visitors there who had some questions. They asked me if I would go talk to these ladies and try to answer their question that they had about Islam. I said, sure, why not? So I went to sit with them. <clears throat> these were two young college girls, about 19 each. And they were asking me about a question, a question about the treatment of women. And they said, I, only, I have one question, then that's it. I said, you only have one question. I said, there's only one question standing between you and understanding real Islam. Is that it? You heard me explain we believe in one God. We've talked about how we have to worship him and do what he wants us to do, etc. And you just have one question. They said, that's right. I said, well, that's great. What's your question? They said, we want to know why you have a petition between the men and the women. Why is there this hijab or curtain or petition in your masjid here separating the men from the women? I said, that's your only question. They said, yeah. I said, this is amazing. Nothing else. You understand what I talked about, how God is one, how you have to do what he wants you to do. They said, yeah, yeah, we got all that. I said, okay, good. So this is the only thing holding you back. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, let me explain something to you. In Islam, we consider it an honor for us to give answers to questions. So we thank you for asking us about our religion. The next thing is, we must always tell the truth. It's not an option for us. And if we don't tell the truth, Allah will put us in hell for that. So definitely, we want very much to be on that truth. Next thing is, we have the proof. Everything in Islam has been recorded, authenticated, and preserved for over 1,400 years. And keeping that in mind, I want you to think that what I'm going to say to you today, you can verify for yourself. And by the way, a lot of times we find questions that are not really questions. They have statements in them that mean be straightened out. And in this case, your question is a good one. And I'd like to mention that the answer to it has helped people get into Islam. And they're looking at me like, what? And then I began to give them the answer. But before I did, I said, if you hear something that I'm going to say today that makes you feel good, and you say, gee, I like that. That's something I didn't know. This is something I like for me, something I want to do then are you going to be prepared to consider worshiping your Lord alone without any partners? Because in reality, that's all Islam is about. It's about worshiping God on his terms. And are you going to be ready to do that? They said, well, uh, what's the answer? I said, okay. Before I go any further, can I ask you a question? What's your religion? They said, yeah, we're Catholic. I said, well, that's good. Catholic is a religion been around for a long time. But I want to ask you, in your religion, the best of the best of your women, how do they dress? Don't they cover all up? They said, yeah, 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 but that's not our question. We're not asking about the covering, the hijab. No, no, no. We're asking about the petition in the masjid. Why do you have a separation of the men from the women? I said, well, this is a part of the answer. But I want you to come from your point of view so you can understand. Do you have women that are considered your best women? And don't they wear this hijab, this covering? They said, yeah, we have that. I said, okay. Now, do these women have babies? They said, oh, no, never. I said, why? They said, they never get married. I said, okay, they don't ever get married? Why? They said, um, because they're married to God? I said, that's a good one. You guys have a problem with the Muslims that we can get married to four wives, but you're saying your God can get married to how many? <laughs> I'm just joking, but still, it's something for you to think about when you start talking about Islam compared to other religions. And they said, well, yeah, but what about this petition? We want to know why do you have it? I said, well, I'm coming to that. If you understand in Islam, the best of the best of our women do wear the hijab. That's true. But at the same time, they're encouraged to get married. We like for the Muslims to get married and to have babies. That's a good purpose of marriage, isn't it? That we should get married, have children, and subhanAllah, this is a, a, a beautiful part of our life, that it's complete, it's holistic. We don't ask people to give up a natural instinct to be religious. 
we ask them to follow what God has put in their hearts, which is to get married and have children. Now, when a woman has a baby, she has to nurse her baby. Isn't that true? They said, well, yes. And I said, now, how could a woman come to this mosque and sit here and listen to this program tonight and have a baby? She'd have to feed it. Now, how could she do that? So here you have this petition which allows the women to remove their hijab and sit and relax. If they have a baby, they can feed their baby because they can expose themselves in front of other women. They just can't do it in front of strange men. So she doesn't have to wear the covering behind this screen. And in fact, the women from your church, the Catholic church, have to wear their hijab or their covering or what's called the habit. They have to wear it all the time. They wear it from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep. The only time they don't wear it is when they go to sleep at night. Whereas for the Muslim women, they never have to wear it, except when they're going to be out in public or if some strange man would come to their house. So this is the difference. And what we do by putting the petition up is to make it in such a way that these women have a place that they can come, relax, and enjoy the program. They can remove their hijab. They can feed their babies and take care of their normal things that they would do even in the privacy of their home. So this is the reason for this. It is not mandated in Islam to put a wall up like that. In fact, at the time of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, they didn't used to do that. They didn't need to, especially at night or in the morning because it's dark. And under the normal, natural darkness that occurs, they could come and go without being really noticed. But when we add these lighting facilities that we have today, you have these bright fluorescent lights, incandescent lights, then certainly you want to make up for that. And how you do that is by having this petition where the ladies can go by behind them and have this privacy that otherwise was afforded to them by the natural darkness. They said, oh, we didn't know that. We didn't realize that. I said, that's okay. There's another point too, though. I'd like to ask you this. You see how Islam is providing for the needs of the woman, right? They said, yeah. I said, Islam is a lot more than you realize because it gives always a balance. And there's a beautiful balance in Islam when we talk about the difference between the men and the women. Men have different needs than women, and women have different needs than men. And Islam is providing for that, as we just saw in this example. So then I asked them a question. If the best of the best of your men and the best of the best of your women are not allowed to get married and to procreate and to have children, doesn't that mean then that only the worst of the worst of your men and the worst of the worst of your women are getting married and having babies? And ultimately, what would be the society that only the worst of the people are giving birth and only the worst of the people are continuing in the society? Whereas in Islam, the best of the men and the best of the women are encouraged to get married, to have children, to procreate, and then to raise them up as good, responsible citizens, as good, responsible Muslims, obeying God and doing His will here on earth. They said, well, we never thought about that before. I said, well, you know, really, that's something for us all to think about. Because Islam is not something that's a man-made religion. It's a complete way of life, giving the balance to everything, giving the rights and the limits that go along with the proper balance of life. So we understand from this that Islam is not making life difficult. Rather, it's solving problems from God's point of view, not from our point of view. And then I said, you know, because you've asked me this question, it means God has guided you to come to us to learn about this message. Therefore, this is your opportunity to think about it. You need to pray about this and ask God to guide you. And with that, I left them. The next year, I came back and I visited the same community. And I was in the same masjid. And I was giving another lecture. And I said, let me tell you what happened when I was here last year. After my lecture, there were two girls and they asked me why we have this partition here between the men and the women. And I explained to them that this is something that we put here so that the women would have a place for privacy. They could remove their hijab and they could nurse their babies and they could just relax in general. And then I asked those women, what about in your religion where you have the nuns and the priests who are not allowed to get married? They're not allowed to have children. And we all know what that could lead to. 
some very serious consequences. And while I was talking about this same subject, everybody in the masjid started laughing. Ha, 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 ha. I said, why are you laughing? They said, Sheikh, we know about it. I said, what do you mean? They said, after you left, those women came back and they made shahada. They entered Islam. And they're on the other side of that petition right now. I said, oh my God. They said, yeah, they understood the message and they became Muslims. I said, Allahu Akbar. And that particular incident is the one that caused me to realize how important it is for us to begin to understand our religion, our way of life of Islam, and be able to present it in simple terms. Because not only is it good for us, it's good for them, and it gives people the chance to enter Islam. And since that time until now, we've been trying to work on the methodology or the menhaj of our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him to know and understand the presentation of the real meaning behind what's Islam. And subhanAllah, it's led us to have this very program you're watching right now. This segment of this program called Lifting the Fog is a result of that incident which occurred a number of years ago in that masjid in Ramadan. And since then, when we've presented answers to questions, we start with that same format where we tell them, thank you for asking about our religion. In our religion, we have the truth. And we must speak the truth, otherwise we can be punished by Allah. And we have the proof to back it up. What we say is documented. It's not something I can make up or change or alter to suit the situation. It stays firm and concrete all the time. This helps me when I present to you this message. Because I don't have to waver or quaff one way or the other. I know what I'm saying is backed up by 1400 years of documentation. And then, while you're listening to the answer, consider if this is a good way for you. And if you like this way of submitting to God's will, maybe it can change your life. And I always ask the people to go and pray in your heart and ask Allah to guide you. And speaking of being guided, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to be on this same subject, talking about the way Islam treats the women, and in particular, how to answer these questions when people come to you with these harsh attacks. Stay tuned for more right here on Huda TV. This is Yusuf Estes reminding you it's only Allah who guides. May Allah guide us all. Ameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose whom he wills subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy, for his messengership, for the revelation to be revealed. This is not for the human beings to make that decision. If a person would turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, truthfully, asking for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to forgive. We have as Muslims a duty, and that is to recite the book of Allah, to ponder over the verses, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to act according to the Quran. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses everything, but it who what this mercy will be for. And the Prophet ﷺ was sent to all mankind. So the Ummah or the people of the Prophet ﷺ are all mankind since the time of the Prophet ﷺ till the Day of Judgment. Why waste our life without getting to know every verse in the Quran, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? We want to continue in this segment talking about the questions that people present to us about women. And I'll give you another example of something that happened during a lecture. This happened to be in my own hometown in Virginia. I was at the Nova College giving a talk over there. A woman walked in right in the middle of our talk, and she just stood there pointing at the ladies' section, pointing to the Muslim sisters, and she said, I want to know something. I, I want to ask a question. Why are those women dressed like that? I said, whoa, <laughs> you just walk in like that, huh? Okay. She said, yeah, I want to know, why are those women dressed like that? It was a very harsh question the way she brought it. The Muslim sisters turned, and they were looking at her for having asked this question like that. 
And all of them, by the way, they're wearing the hijab, mashallah. And I decided right then it was important for me to give the correct response to the question. Now, sometimes when we answer a question, we have to take in consideration who's asking it and what they mean by the question. It's not just simply to say, okay, there's a surah in the Quran called Surah An-Nur, chapter 24, verse 31, tells the women. No, because if you go into this, this is assuming that this person already believes in Allah, already believes in the Quran, and that they're going to take this as a fatwa or a ruling. Whereas a non-Muslim coming to you with this question, this is not going to make a lot of sense to them. If you said, well, this is what Allah says, they say, who is Allah? This is what the Quran says. What's that? I want to know how come those women are dressed like that. And that was her question. So it came to me. And I realized, just as we're talking in this series, that you have to present the answer to the question in the same vein that the person is asking it so that they can get the proper response from you. Let me explain like this. Consider that a person is coming to you in a harsh and antagonistic way. Ah, yeah, 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 like this. And if you would just sit there and calmly say, thank you for asking me about my religion, you're going to disarm them. They're going to say, what? Huh? They didn't expect that. And that's basically what I did. I said, well, hold on. We appreciate your question. Thank you for asking about our religion. But let me ask you a question. And you see, this gives you a chance to let them think about what they said. Let me ask you a question, I said to her. Why are you dressed like that? She said, huh? I said, yes. And always go back to the same thing when you're doing this with the people. Explain to them in Islam, we appreciate their uh, question. We appreciate their interest in Islam. And at the same time, we have the truth, and we have to say the truth, or we can be punished by Allah. And we must always remind them that we have the proof to back it up. We have the Quran, we have the Sunnah preserved so that people can see for themselves. They want to check it out. They're most welcome to do so. Okay? And by the way, when you're listening to the answer, if you find something that you like, something that appeals to you, and you see it's practical for your life, then why not consider worshiping your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord, without any partners? Because that's what Islam is about. So now here with this lady, what did I say to her? I said, I want to ask you a question. Why are you dressed like that? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, look at you. You're wearing a long dress. She was. Her dress came down like my coat. It's very long. Her dress came all the way down to the floor. And the neckline was very high, covering her up very good. I said, why are you dressed like this? She said, what do you mean? I said, okay. When you were born, how were you dressed? She just stared at me kind of funny. I said, well, let me help you. You weren't wearing anything at all. You were naked, in the buff, nude, no clothes, right? <gasps> Oh, my God. I said, well, that is true, right? She said, well, uh, uh, and while she's sputtering and spartan like that, I said, okay, so if you're born without any clothes at all, then why would people put clothes on? Because isn't your question dealing with the logic behind the way they're dressed? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, look at them. How are they dressed? Why are they wearing what they wear? She said, well, uh, uh, I don't know. It's oppressive. It's uh, uh, uh. I said, well, let me answer the question for you. Why are you dressed like you're dressed is because of what? What is the reason you have dressed like this? By now, she was pretty flustered. She said, modesty, modesty. I said, ah. Now, if you turn to these women and you say the same thing to them, why are you dressed like that? What will they tell you? Modesty. And who's to determine what modesty is? In Islam, Allah is the one who tells us what modesty is. So it's up to Him, the Creator and the Sustainer of everything, to tell us what the rules are. And He has shown us what modesty really is. And for the woman's dress, He makes it real clear in His book how a woman should dress to be modest. That she should cover her body. Her attire should be such that it doesn't show off her adornments and her attractions. And this is modesty. And by the way, I'd like to mention something else to you, ma'am. What you considered to be modesty, based on your logic, they took what was instructed to them by Allah, and they consider that the right modesty. The only difference between your clothes and their clothes is about six or eight inches of material covering their head. 
And if you think about it, for that few inches of material, you would be dressed just like them. And all for what? Your opinion of modesty versus God's opinion of modesty. So what do you say to that? Well, she got mad and left the room. But the people who stayed in the room, alhamdulillah, many of them accepted Islam right there and then on that day. And in fact, one of my dear friends who became Muslim that day still is uh, talking on these subjects that we discussed on that day. I want to mention this because when people see the real truth presented in the right way, then it's up to Allah to guide them. But at least we did our best in presenting the message. True, the lady went out. And she didn't stay to hear the rest of the program. But it did have a good effect on the non-Muslims and the Muslims alike. Because now, how do you think the Muslim sisters feel? They feel very much vindicated here because someone has presented their side of it in a logical way. The lady said modesty. This is what our sisters are saying. Only difference is you don't get to make up what modesty is. That would just be somebody's judgment. Whereas God has already given us the judgment in the Quran. The modesty is determined by him. And he tells us in the Quran, now we can go to the surah. Now we can talk about this chapter. Surah An-Nur, chapter 24, verse 31. And tell the believing women to lower their gaze, to guard their private parts. And now this is the modesty God is telling about. And when they go out, what do they need to do? And Allah said for them to draw the khimar down over juyubahinna. And what is juyubahinna? This is their chest area, so that they don't show any of the cleavage. So the idea here, and Allah is telling that in front of certain men who are not your fathers, not your brothers, not your husbands, not your sons, etc., these men you guard your adornments and guard your modesty. And this is how to do it. And Allah has told you, this is the verse that explains that. Oh, mashallah. And it helps people to understand. What happened later was the one who was doing the, promog- the program for the Muslim Students Association told me, he said, you know who that woman was that came in here? I said, I don't know. He said, that was my professor. And he said, now when I go back to class, I'm afraid she's going to give me an F. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. She asked a question, we gave her the answer. Later on, I asked him about the professor and he said, you know what happened? In fact, she gave me a very good grade. And she was impressed with the way that we gave her the answer. She liked it. And this is what it should be. The people don't have to accept Islam. That's up to them. But we have to present the answer in a way they can understand it. And that's basically what we're trying to do here. We're not saying that these are the answers which will cause people to go to Islam. No. What we're saying is that these are the answers that give them the understanding of the meaning of the response to their question in their language, in simple terms. That's the best we can do. There is one other thing that you can add to this. After you've presented Islam to the best of your ability, you should ask them, are you now prepared to begin to worship your creator, your sustainer, without partners? And if they say, well, yeah, then begin to talk to them about the Shahada. And what is the Shahada? The Shahada basically is to bear witness and open testimony. There really is only one God. And he has no partners. And that all of our worship and our love and our devotion is for him and him alone. And that he has no associates of any kind. He has no daughters or sons or uncles or aunts or father or mother. He is God alone. When they understand that and they understand the concept of the worship, then it's up to Allah to guide them. But you can encourage them to make their shahada. One of the things that you can do in this regard is just to simply ask them, who is your mother? They'll say, well, my mother is Sarah or Mary. Okay, who is your father? My father is Jim or Bill or Omar. Okay, fine. Now, you have no problem telling me who your father is and who your mother is. And would you bear witness to this fact in public? They say, sure, why not? Okay, if you're willing to do that, then why not tell us in public who is your God? You've stated who your parents are. Why not tell us who your God is? And they go, well, yeah, that makes sense. Well, having understood that, let's do it. Say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. And then explain them the meaning behind it. I bear witness and open testimony. There is none worthy to be worshipped except the one true God, Allah. And I bear witness and open testimony that Muhammad is his messenger and his servant. 
And once they've made their shahada, then it's up to Allah. Now, in talking to the people, many times when you begin to present this, you might feel intimidated. You might feel like, this is too much, I can't do that. Well, just try your best. But the most important thing really isn't in your conversation. Believe me, it isn't. The most important thing is in your intention. So when you're talking to them, remember you're talking to them on behalf of what is Islam. And you're trying to lift up this fog and remove the confusion and make it clear for them what Islam is really teaching and what it's all about. When you do that, there's one more little final point. Get up in the night, in the middle of the night, and make wudu. Wash yourself up. And then set out your prayer rug in front of you and pray to Raqqa and pray for these people in the camel lail. And ask Allah to guide them. Because whoever Allah guides, nobody will misguide them. But whoever Allah misguides, they'll never be guided. So that's the simple way to wrap up this part of our program on the subject of lifting the fog. Let's all work together to lift this fog. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.